Yes, the name. Um, this ought to work. Laser point at the top. Arrows left and right. Okay. Everyone hear me offline? Online, hopefully. Um, I'm going to talk uh, today about um, Comlair, and not Comlair itself particularly, but how to build a whole beamline, because that's really what we want to do. We want to simulate a beamline, protons on target, and we want to go to um, the, the beam stop or source. And um, I'm clicking with the mouse. And so I'm going to try and yeah, try, I think, yeah. yay, happiness. The first most important thing to remember is just how awful we are, all of us. Uh, this is um, uh, a reflector moderator system. This is a beam line. They are immensely complicated, real world. Really, really, really complicated. Yet what we simulate is a pile of rubbish. It is the most simple rubbish model on the planet. And this is not because we choose to. It's because we can't model the complex stuff. So much effort is, is put in to model this stuff that we don't put all the fancy pipes, all the magnets, all the cables, all the vacuum tubes, all the stuff that actually turns out to get really active. So obviously plays quite an important part in the, the problem. Uh, no, this one. Right, yay. But why? Well, half the problem is MCMPX, which is nothing short of a nightmare. I will not use any other words. Every volume needs to be described in individual quadratics. You have to completely describe the volume. Surfaces like toruses are a pile of rubbish in MCMPX standard. Almost everybody I know puts them in so they can go on a general access. Um, and the code, when you look at it, is assembly language. There is nothing else that describes it. In fact, assembly language, when I used to write that as a kid, is much more readable than this. <laughs> and everything, absolutely everything, the guys put into MCMPX to help you make models hurts you so badly that anybody using them is crazy. The complementary cells get rid of them. Universes, they're a joke because they just slow everything down so much. Transform cards, they're singlet. They have um, gimbal lock. They don't implement full algebra, full geometric algebra. Macro bodies are just a mess that slowly go down and there's no Boolean invariances. All of that, I have no idea why it's there. What we want is is something like this. This is Conlayer, by the way. I'm not going to show you pictures from something else. That's a Conlayer picture of, of objects. What we want to do is hijack the McStass idea. McStass does this really well. Here's a chopper. Everything about the chopper's there. We don't have to think. There's a chopper. I want chopper housing. I want windows for the beam. I want motors. I want uh, nuts, bolts, screws. This chopper assembly has got nearly about 1,300 components, something like that. And I want to put them down one after another because the SS for whatever it is um, seems to think that every beam line needs 400 choppers. I mean, I, no, I'm not joking. The worst beam line has 12 chopper assemblies. This is crazy. And if you want to model them individually, you will die. So this is um, a little bit, not all of, um, prior, sorry, I have to remember. And it's on a slope, it goes down, it has multiple choppers, and this is only 11 meter section. You see one, two, three, four, five choppers, polymer units and some other things in there and things complicated. What you need to do that to even keep track is to have a toolbox. And so we need toolbox. Um, and we need the following things that do not come from MCMPX. When we have an output of an MCMPX file, it has to be good to run. No failures, no problems, no possibilities, no lost particles, nothing. I want it to either be good or bad. That's the statement. If it is bad, I want to know now before I even start running it. I want to be able to look at it so I can see what the problem is, but I want to know this is not a good part. I want to stop the stupidity of calling surfaces by numbers. I do not want to call materials by numbers because you'll make mistakes. If you have material 38 in tungsten, oh no, we typed it wrong and it's 39 and you've got water or something. How many people have wrecked models like that? You do not make a mistake when you write water. Yeah, you might get the wrong temperature a little bit when you write water 300 or water 270, but it's not a drastic error. You, you will not make a mistake when you write tungsten. You, you're not going to get water. <laughs> and I want the whole system to deal with the tally and the variance reduction all in one go. I don't want to think. I want a default variance reduction that's probably good enough, because actually most of the time it's 
So how are we going to do this? The first thing is we want to be McStass. Serious, that's probably a big compliment for McStass. I want to be McStass, but I want to do this in a proper three-dimensional world where things overlap. And that means I have to make some changes to how I think. And the first thing is I want to decouple the idea of how I assemble things, or where I assemble things, and how they overlap. And I want them completely decoupled from my mental thinking. So first we're going to talk about how to put things in space, where things need to be, what orientations they need to be, and, and so on. And that's simply the ComLab principle. We are going to define everything is going to be a fixed component, or some derivation of that, so a group of fixed components. So let's talk about a chopper house. It is a fixed component. That means it has an origin. It has a proper origin somewhere in space. It's an object that so has actually a name. So it could be the Dream Chopper 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 3, whatever you want to call it. And so we can have many chopper housings, but we only have one name for this chopper housing that we have. So it has an origin and an axis. The next thing is it can have lots of things in it. It can be made of lots of things. I don't care what those things are. And each one of those is referenced relative to its axis and origin, both axis and origin. You rotate this object and all these things come with it. That's good. So, but it now does something else, and it's important. It has an export system for exporting not just its axis and origin. That's not enough. But it can export another of link points, another surface map, the outside boundaries, and points on that boundary. So you can export those points somewhere else. Take a chopper housing. You might want to connect a beam line to the lower port. You need motor to the motor axis. You need, I don't know, lifting hooks perhaps, or an assembly at the bottom. So you need a multiple set, any number you like, of these export link points. Uh, that one. OK, so what do you do with this? What we're going to do, and we'll talk about insertion in a minute, you throw things in and you start building beam lines. So when you build a beam line, when you're thinking about a beam line, you build it as a straight line. You don't have to worry about the axis, the rotations, the fact there's a bender. It doesn't matter. None of this matters any longer. You just build the whole beam line straight, even the bent ones, because you just take the link point to the end of the bender, and now we just carry straight on. Everything can get built. This is a, an assembly of, of one of the, the um, bunker halves, quarters, should I say. Um, everything's endpoint, start point. And you can, that allows you to do big simulations quickly and fast in a hurry when someone wants a pretty picture. So, we have a problem. Problem is MCMP says that thou shall put an object into another object and we will deal with everything in the way. And the way that MCMP implements it with complementary objects is too slow to run. You cannot run it, not on big objects, no way. And we are now talking about assemblies that have thousands of cells in them. And we now need to do the overlap. And this has to be done well. And there is a lot of work within ComLab that buries all this from you so you don't have to think. So that's important. We have to do it well and we want no thinking. So what happens? We simply say, this is an object. This, this top object, uh, if you're looking on, online, it's the, the blue one or the bit that's in the square of the blue one. That is some object, let's call it a chopper. And let's suppose we need to intersect it with some other object which is going to cut it away. So we have a priority, A cuts B. That's it, nothing complicated. So the orange object or the red square is the, the B object doing the cutting, i.e. it takes precedence. So we now need to, in Conlayer, we sit there and Conlayer knows that that composite first object is made of lots of cells. So we test and find which cells really themselves intersect. So we have a set of cells which are highlighted blue, which really do intersect this, this second red object. And then we do another test, which is down at the surface level. We work out which surfaces intersect the, those cells, cut them away, and keep them into the system. And only those surfaces that need to be there, because you don't need this outer plane of this box, because it's, it's by default, not there. And that improves runtime by an astonishing factor, because MCMPX transports via a, the surface interaction map, i.e. it keeps track of which cells 
have shared surfaces with other cells. And if you can cut the number of surface boundaries down, your runtime improves by the number of orange surfaces squared divided by the total number of um, interaction surfaces squared. That's a huge runtime performance for doing no work other than building a model in some random guy's program. To help us do this, we've had some additional tools, right? One of the first things everyone says, oh yes, yes, we should do some fancy splitting of cells. Okay, I do fancy splitting the cell. This is a fancy splitting of the cell. This is an approximation for the wall. We split it into um, three dimensions, 24 plus 30 cells this way, 30 plus cells this way, and there's also 30 cells in the radial direction. And I want an XML file so I can set any individual one of those cells to any material I want. And I want that, and those cell divisions, by the way, are not linear. They, they virtually pseudo-quadratic. And I want to allow that to go into the cell variant reduction. And I want to do it with this much code. That's it. That is the entire code that splits that wall. Everything including the, the header. And that's not code that, that I've just put together nicely for this. You can go to the GitHub and find that code. That code's been around six months to make the bunker splitty. Right? This is not fake. And all I simply do is simply say which pairs of surfaces I wish to divide between. It doesn't matter whether they're surfaces, they're, they're, they're cylinders, toruses, planes, I don't care. Just divide the two surfaces. It can actually divide between lots of, like a, a cylinder and a plane if it needs to. And you simply divide them, say how many fractions you want between them, and then you simply run the thing, set material from a database if you want to do it. Done. No work. At the same time, we have this system of putting objects into objects. So we have pipe systems that allow us to drive pipes within the systems, multi-layer pipes, that therefore do all the nice little joins for you. That's all automatic. You don't have to think. You don't want to do any work, remember? That's my, always my uh, approach. Um, and basically, any convex profile for a pipe is, is acceptable. And by convex, I mean two to the quadratic convex equation, not the simple planar convex everyone's well aware of. Um, Variance reduction. I'm going to skim through variance reduction. There is a number of variance reduction within Comlag. Comlag can actually run its own Monte Carlo if it wants to. I don't recommend it, but you can do it. And therefore, it's got tools to help you explore variance reduction. But the default one works on a semi-adjoint basis. And it works by using a Markov chain process. Right? It divides up the system into cells, either your cell-based or um, a mesh-based. It doesn't make any difference. And what it does is it tracks the... the um, in cell-based, you have to keep track of whether a cell can reach another cell directly, and you track an approximate transport from this cell to the next cell, and then you use a, a Markov chain process to, uh, to establish the overall transportation through the cells. After that, you use a semi-adjoint, and by I say semi-adjoint, what I do is I approximate the source points or planes or surfaces, and I approximate the tally points, planes and surfaces, uh, to make uh, an amalgamation of the variance reduction. And that gives me my basic weight window component, split across energies, so the value of transport between here is changed for the energy grid. And then you have to do another trick. If you want to do this, if you want to do protons on target to here, which is what that is, uh, it took a while. <laughs> it's in about a day, but protons on target, 30, 40 meters odd. That's impressive. You need not just, you cannot just get away with, with weight window biasing. It's not enough. You need to use the um, much maligned XT card, which is the angular bias. Now, the beauty here is everybody who does this by hand will get it wrong, I promise you. Your normalization term will not be one, and your results are garbage. I cannot believe you can do it by hand. Oh. Uh, you don't need to scroll oh. to the next one. Oh. 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 No, 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 no. Well, anyway, let me talk while you're busy scroll. Yeah. So, so, my so, right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, someone is scrolling. Could you please stop scrolling? <laughs> A person scrolling. Okay, I right. like to talk. Right, we'll end up here somewhere. It's not a long talk. I said no. it's 15 minutes. Um, you, you'll have the slides afterwards for yourself. Yes. No worries. 
and I will talk to you ad nauseum if you really want me to. I like beer when I do it, but anyway. <laughs> so what we're doing is here, we have a system for doing this calculation. And what it does is, because it can effectively see the transport between the, I don't know, it can see the transport down the beam line is very high because a cell at very close to the target has a very high transport down the beam line. You get a very, very high angular bias just on the surface cells that run down the beam line. And that allows you to transport an awful lot of flux or dose down towards the target. And in clear, what this really benefits from is the LD3 splitting, this layer 3 splitting, because if you don't split this this um, guide into these micro cells. So you have a very small surface cell. This doesn't work. So you need the two things together. And you need the variance mesh map to, to allow you to basically get out of the moderator and target to get to where you want to be. So it's a combination. I got lucky with four. Four, four went really nicely. <laughs> We've done other beam lines though, and we're getting lucky with that, which is good. So we're getting some um, Valentina uh, in my group has got lucky with um, NMX, and now we're happily getting NMX down to 30, 40 meters comfortably, and we're looking at 100 meters. Um, so in short, um, we have some tools to help you build complex geometries. Right? I'm building it like McStash. So I have lots and lots of components, guides, benders, um, uh, choppers, collimators, um, things I can't remember people come and ask me for. Um, we have the position to offer faster target to sample calculations, and we can build code a one level away from MCM hex. MCM is great as long as you don't build it. In the same way that it's great to write, it's great to have your compiler build assembly code, as long as you don't have to write it. <laughs> right? Uh, you can download the code from GitHub. Oh. Uh, ouch, I'm at both there, never mind, you say. Um, you can comfortably get the code from GitHub. I reckon, to give you a feel for just how quick it is, I reckon I can build a beam line in four hours. Any beam line I haven't done, and we'll bet someone beer on this. I.e., you come with your beam line, I build your beam line in four hours, and you pay for my drinking while I'm doing it. <laughs> Otherwise, I pay for your drinking. Four hours for a typical ESS beam line, because that's about as long as you can ever get a beam line scientist to sit down and tell you what's in his beam line. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments, here, there? Other one. Is there a manual? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of questions are that? <laughs> so, so, yeah. uh, <laughs> Constantine uh, answered loud and clearly no. Uh, he also asked if uh, if it was really a GitHub or was it GitHub? Uh, uh, anyway, yeah. can, can I state, although there is not a manual, I have done several tutorial courses. They're getting better now. And now there is at least five days worth of tutorial slides and examples that went with that, which you can download from GitHub. And there's a, uh, 250 slides in that. Um, that's about it. I'm really sorry. Um, I will so come and <laughs> show you. I know how boring this is right now. No one <laughs> pays me. No one pays me to develop GitHub. To, to develop Comlab. It is absolutely not on a day job, and and therefore even writing a manual is an astonishing level beyond just catching up. So so I thought uh, if we get around to make a. Uh, uh, another workshop, I mean, uh, we should, it's actually in, in the description of this work package that we mm -hmm. should have uh, another workshop at the end of our work. Uh, I think aspects of, of this goes very well together with this discussion of having aspiration oriented, oriented advantage goals. And, you know, maybe, maybe these things are the aspects of getting uh, getting transport from, uh, from from your source to your yeah, roof in. Uh, Definitely. I, I would like to take some of the advantage stuff yeah. into Conlayer mm. because then I can combine it with the Angular stuff. Now, MCMP interestingly has six phase variance reduction in it, but not proper, not fully implemented. It records the information that allows you, you to do it, but doesn't use it afterwards. What I want is really, really want is six phase, which means the um, the directional one as well, weight windows 
rather than just three phase, which is three coordinate positions. And at that point, Conlad doesn't need to try and hijack the EXT part. <laughs> and it does, it abuses it and hijacks it um, in a way that I know is normalized. And that's the problem with the XT card. It's not a normalized weight of variance reduction card. That makes it potentially lethal. So, you, you, those are things, but you should also normalize it. It should bias to one. It has to. And it can be written in and seen here, and it will happily take any number other than one. And this is not going to go well. Yeah? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, any further comments or questions? No one from uh, remote locations? No? Seems not. Uh, I think if I uh, remember correctly, it's actually lunchtime. Um, so this means that we will pause for uh, another hour or so, I think. Let's see, what did I, what did I claim? An hour, an hour and a half. So uh, two o'clock uh, Coimbra time uh, or Greenwich Mean time uh, with daylight savings <laughs> or, you, you know, yeah. Uh, in one and a half hours, uh, we'll be back from lunch uh, for uh, one more talk, I think, the last one. Um, yeah, so uh, see you then. I wonder which one is maybe that one. <clears throat> nope. So what was uh, what was the file name? <laughs> On your talk? It should be my name. Uh, uh, ah, Sarun. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so sorry for being uh, a few minutes late. Uh, the last talk on, uh, on the schedule is uh, Jan Sarun. Uh, author of uh, Restrex uh, Simulus, Czech Republic, um, and there you go, laser pointer, back and forth, should Thank work. You. Yes. Well, so, uh, uh, thank you, and uh, let me start with the last uh, talk, which is uh, a bit uh, different from the previous ones. Maybe it's more related to the talk given by Pell, because it doesn't relate to, it's not directly to, uh, to the interfacing between uh, ray tracing simulations and particle transport simulations. But essentially, it's more about ray tracing itself. Uh, uh, well, we start with, uh, with this, what we do in ray tracing. Uh, uh, essentially, it's a Monte Carlo method by which we calculate, uh, um, which we calculate uh, the transmission probability function for using uh, rejection sampling. In the rejection sampling method, effectively, uh, uh, we uh, measure the probability of transmission. Uh, but uh, the transmission probability is, is typically very low. Uh, means that the 
uh, variance we get at the end, or relative variance we get at the end, is, is also very low. It's given by uh, um, by binomial uh, distributions and the variance uh, variance looks like that. It depends, of course, on the transmission probability, probability and uh, number of events. Uh, what we want to do is essentially to improve this number, and we can do it either by Making of the simulation, of course, or by increasing transmission probability. Uh, so, this is very important uh, point of fact because essentially, uh, if you if you think of, of the textbook example by integration of a sphere, uh, having a box sampling volume, then the probability gets down quite quickly with increasing dimension. And in the latest in simulations, are Dimension, dimension of the program is typically six or more. Uh, so the question turns out uh, an optimization of uh, um, sampling volume. So how to choose the optimum sampling volume to, to maximize the transmission probability? Uh, let's start with a, with a very simple example, having a neutron guide, is curved. Uh, which is over illuminated by a large source in the beginning, and then you have a sample somewhere after the guide, which is normal size, let's say five millimeter. And let's consider just, just these two dimensions, very simple model of guide without the way of an for that. So the question is, how can we choose the best way to show phase space coordinates? So this is how it looks like when you change the length of the guide from zero, that means we have no guide, just the source and the Target, of course, this is a long figure. If you introduce the guide of different lengths, then the optimum phase space volume, so in the region in the, in the phase space you want to start your neutron, becomes more and more complex, of course. Uh, in the first case, you can, you can quite simply draw a rectangle around this area and, uh, and have almost 100% uh, transmission uh, probability. Which is what is done by by next task very easily with this focusing option in, in angle space and sometimes so uh, time. Uh, Simonas does this uh, uh, in a different way. It can just calculate the covariance matrix of phase space coordinates starting from the analytical model, something like uh, acceptance diagrams, but uh, expressed in Gaussian transformation function, which turns out somewhat is formalized. So from that you can you can estimate, estimate the optimum sampling volume in Nexta in Simenes. Of course, uh, the situation becomes more complicated if you along the guide. Maybe in this case, uh, some uh, advanced uh, version of acceptance diagram code could also help to make uh, to make important sampling. Uh, in this case, very efficient, uh, but in real cases, of course, almost no chance. Uh, uh, can't be handled in that way. You can't get a uh, sampling volume to sample from this distribution. So, of course, the natural way is uh, the other way around. Uh, you can reverse and face in direction by applying just time inversion, which means that you have time and, and uh, momentum of the neutron and trace from the target back to the source. Because these two figures, this is the optimum sampling volume in the source, this is what you get at the sample position. Uh, these are, these are uh, correlated, there is one to one map and the one to the, to the other. It's guaranteed by the start inversion of all the trajectories or interaction, interaction laws uh, of the trajectories. Uh, it means that there really exists inverse. Inverse process, inverse map. Uh, it's good to note that actually the volume, of the white areas here and here are the same. It's here it's here. But the problem is that the topology of this figure is very complex. That's why it's more, sometimes more uh, efficient to go the way around. So we can just do it like that. In fact, in the previous case, we could just turn the direction of neutrons. If you can't do that, you can, you can reverse, reverse the instrument. In case we just just inverse inverse process, and you should get 
the same result at the end, but with, very, with much better efficiency because then you can more easily choose games. Uh, so there are two ways how to do it. So a real reverse tracing is implemented in CMS. So uh, we tried to do it somehow in match test. That's what what this talk is about. Uh, there are a few prerequisites for a true uh, reverse tracing. First, all the uh, instrument components or software implementation must handle tracing in any direction. This is essentially true for, for many XTOS components, like this talk, for example, but not for all. Really, guides do not have this feature. Uh, the second condition is that uh, the source, what we call the source, as a source in Nextas, have two functions. I'll generate neutron and then apply for plug distribution, time structure, and so on. And to, to apply the reverse tracing, we need to decouple these two functions. So we need to have a source as a normal component, a moderator as a normal component, which just rates <coughs> neutron that's given a brightness distribution, and the separate component which generates the event. Uh, and of course, we must have a simulation kernel which, which handles uh, propagation of neutrons reverse, which is not much complicated, just a different sequence of coordinate applications. Uh, so in next task, uh, we went the other way around. We tried to uh, implement the reverse tracing by writing part of the instrument in, in, reverse, in, in reverse direction. Plus, uh, we had to add two special components for, for space and reversal and uh, modify all the moderators we wanted to use. So what was done so far, uh, we, uh, last meeting we presented, I presented uh, a simple example with, with some documentation which can essentially be used as a template for building for, for constructing an express instrument with this feature on. Uh, it, uh, well, schematically, it looks like that. Yeah. You need to have a, a, this uh, source backtrace, which means this is the generator of random variables, which are then can used to uh, uh, follow neutrons through the instrument. You need to have this inverted primary spectrometer description, and you need to have a moderator at the end, which is the component which just puts a value corresponding to the brightness distribution. And of course, handles all the space or the, or the shape properties of the moderator as well. Then we have to restore the initial uh, phase space coordinates of neutrons as they were in the beginning, apply the final final weight, apply the uh, time inversion, possibly with a key rotation to get people in the right uh, direction, and we follow, at least we teleport the, more or less to even back to the to the to this source component and follow to the secondary spectrometer. Uh, so this, this is how the scheme looks like, and this is how the next task template template looks like. It's not that that much complicated. You just need to have available this this component and uh, this component and the moderator, whatever kind you want. So we have done this uh, before for the simple example, which didn't use any special moderator, just a simple source that does that automatically. Uh, I don't uh, know I did this because I presented this video already before. So just illustration that even for a simple, a simple setup, the uh, gain factor is very big. Even for a very, very conservative uh, setup, it's not a large sample factor, the gain factor, Mm -hmm. Computed time is to call it two orders of magnitude, and we of course get exactly the same results. Yeah. So we decided to apply this to something uh, something real that means uh, to construct uh, the next task model of the beer deflectometer with these two options so that we can easily switch from reverse to, uh, to forward tracing. Uh, the deflectometer is one of these long instruments, and I think most of you know it. Uh, so it's 150 meters long. It includes a lot of components along, along, the, along the neutron guide, which is 
several sections of curved and straight bites, elliptic uh, uh, either in the beginning, elliptic uh, focusing at the end, with uh, the bite spectral extraction update, which is a sort of semi transparent micro channel guide, number of choppers in between, and so on. So, next class model altogether have about 35 components. So, so, we have two versions of the primary part to the sample, to the slit in front of the sample to be precise. And we had these two adapted uh, components. Uh, we had to override the ESS moderator to decouple this event generation from it. And we also used the diffraction monitor, which makes evaluation of the detected diffractograms from, from three dimensional data, the neutrons, uh, etc. And also, we developed a new component for this semi transparent, which we didn't have as a lot of instance. So, uh, the ESS moderator essentially uh, uses as much as possible of the code which is, which is available in Nextus. So, we just, on top of this ESS source library, we have some additional functions to. Uh, to, to, to ensure that they execute this, this uh, mutant generation. We have this, this uh, diffraction monitor, which is essentially a modification of, of the cylindrical monitor, uh, which is available in Nextus, allowing us to, to generate diffractograms out of this XYG coordinates. Then the, the instrument itself, the instrument file itself is. Uh, Written in a very simple way, it's essentially an envelope which, which includes some basic definitions. These are just uh, top level control parameters of the instrument where you can choose the wavelength range, uh, type curvature, uh, slit sizes, uh, uh, one of several predefined resolution modes which can calculate the properties of choppers, etc. And then we have only this in, in, in the body of the traces. We have common input parameters. So we have one source of parameters to define for both those ways of simulation. And then you just choose for what data is tracing in the primary part and then the secondary part, which includes all the same radial kilometer. So we tested that. Uh, uh, from all the figures we had, I would like just to show you the diffractograms we generated with this, uh, this model. The test sample was uh, uh, was uh, austenite uh, of uh, a cylindrical shape, uh, but uh, because we simulate something which uh, uh, which uh, approaches the experiments which will be really done in the year, it means engineering oriented experiments. So I do we have a large a large sample with with uh, gauge volume which uh, which defines part of the material which is homogeneous. In the case of in-situ experiments, if you have something like a cylinder sample in the loading machine, then you want to define something from inside the sample where you have a minimum standard distribution. So that, for that case, uh, the typical uh, gauge volume size uh, is defined by a 5 mm byte slit uh, with, with 4 mm radial kilometer secondary part. So it is 5 cm before the sample. Then we chose, in this case, we tried to simulate with the medium resolution, which is something which corresponds to most of the other instruments in the world, including monochromatic instruments, would typically be used for this case. Uh, detector coverage is 30 degrees plus particular. Well, uh, and then what we get with forward and reverse phase, uh, we tried first to make a long round to have good statistics in both cases. In the case of uh, standard forward tracing, we get something like 3%. Minimum error means um, the error at the, the highest point of the exchange. Uh, it took 12 hours with my laptop, single, single process, single core. Uh, in the reverse case, just by commenting out one line and in the other, we got the same result. In a slightly shorter time, but with much, much higher precision. So, if you try to recalculate this to some gain factors, uh, what you get 
in the forward and reverse facing is the big factor in the simulation efficiency. That means the ratio between successful trials and the number between the successful events of the detector and number of initial trials. Then, of course, the, the gain factor is, is very high, more than 1,000. But what is really interesting, of course, is time saving. That means what you have to compare is the gain factor in the, in the time of calculation for given accuracy. So we use our results to, uh, to recalculate all these numbers to the same accuracy. And we arrive to the gain factor level. That means that essentially, 0.3% is something which, which gives you good enough data to find processing and so on. And for the testing, we would need something like 10 hours of the same few minutes as the rest of us. It's important to note that uh, this for medium resolution, it's relatively large gauge volume with respect to the type of experiments you want to do here. For example, if you imagine that you would like to measure strain, uh, strain scanning with a small gauge volume, something like one by one by 10 millimeters gauge volume with high resolution, which you need sometimes, then of course you will get much longer times in the forward direction. But in the reverse direction, computing time is almost independent of the size of the gauge volume, which is good. So here's what, what you get uh, if you try to define the computing time. And uh, so we uh, run the simulation for one hour with uh, forward tracing, and we get what you see on the left side. In the case of uh, medium resolution setup and high resolution setup, it is computation. So this is what, what we what we had noticed before on the previous slides. In the high resolution case, you still get very good. Uh, very good data in just one minute, you get almost nothing in the device tracing in the tracing. So uh, that's the results we have so far. Uh, unfortunately, the solution from XPAS is, is not user friendly. So I mean, this may, be, this may be a good platform to discuss the options, what can be done the site of Nextpass in a way that this option is available for, for more users. It's, it's worth trying. Uh, how about Google Base? The, the, the points I, I wrote here uh, uh, aim at some modification of the source components, which probably are necessary in any case. Uh, uh, the uh, converted uh, primary spectrometer can be done maybe in the source, in the, in the site of the cogeneration, within the telescopes maybe. Uh, of course, this method has some disadvantages. Maybe how do you, how do you, how do you apply it? Uh, other spacing means that you cannot put your monitor somewhere in between your components and think you have the right flux with measure. You have, but you could have actually, not directly. You could have reverse traced neutrons, that means you can see what are your useful neutrons which you try to sample, which is again very useful information, but it's not the physical information you would have. So somehow users have to be aware of this. There are some tricks which need to be done in order to make uh, next task monitors automatically detect these reverse traced neutrons. So then just to place them in the position, you need to ensure that they get proper right. Uh, something like uh, next us you have this initialization trace sections, sections like post tracing so would be very useful. Uh, <laughs> we have to follow the finals. And that, that, that's that, that, the that final ask is called after each uh, register. Because this no. is something we need something which is called yeah. after just Then okay. And maybe it, the there are some tricks. Yeah, which, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. you can extend or yeah. do something like that. But uh, but the advantages are, are obvious, and uh, mm, so the reason why we did it, of course, is because of the deal instrument that we want to make our simulations to provide next us next us model for process people. 
and uh, to really uh, to really simulate uh, actual experiments with that in a reasonable time to do some numerical optimization as well, which is possible with the non-minute simulation methods we have also Uh yeah. Okay, so I think that's it. Mm -hmm. nice. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments?